Good afternoon and good morning everybody. This is GP. I'm the principal uh, founder at Stack Armor. I'm going to be a host for today's webinar and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, security, compliance and the AWS cloud. Uh, just by way of quick introduction, uh, we will be having a good team of panelists and uh, folks that will walk you through uh, a demo and also provide you an opportunity to have Q&A. Uh, with me are my co-host, Fawad Siraj. He is the chief architect and co-founder at Stack Armor. We also have uh, Terry Grogan, who is our director of compliance services at Stack Armor. He has uh, had many, many decades of, uh, I guess, years of experience with security and compliance, particularly on cloud, and so we are very happy to be on this webinar with you and talk to you a little bit about this topic. So really quickly, a little bit about Stack Armor. We are a security and compliance solutions provider based in Tyson's, Virginia. And for years, we have supported government clients um, as well as large organizations that are interested in implementing uh, cloud-based systems that comply with specific security and compliance requirements. And so really today's topics that we want to cover with you are a service that we've found a lot of customers need that are interested in implementing a strong information security program and architecture. So please feel free to submit your questions. We will make sure we address them. Again, I'm your host, GP with Stack Armor, and we'll talk to you a little bit about security and compliance. So this is an interesting project we just recently did uh, a few weeks ago. And this is a scenario where one of our customers, a very large uh, government customer, uh, had a developer uh, that was sort of following DevOps practices, uh, mistakenly embedded his access and secret keys in this code and unfortunately submitted it in the GitHub library, and uh, that can have disastrous consequences. And uh, while cloud, cloud security, uh, policy enforcement has been around for a long time now, um, it's really interesting to us to see some of these incidents still continue to happen. And the reason for that is uh, cloud security is new. There's a whole new set of users that are on the cloud and so it's very important to go in and make sure that organizations that are leveraging the cloud, which has some really important and critical features and powerful features, they're able to do it in a manner that is secure. And so I just thought I'd start the presentation with this real example that really just happened a few weeks ago. Luckily for us, uh, we specialize in continuous monitoring and policy enforcement, and we were able to catch this situation and immediately implement uh, our incident response protocol, which we'll talk to you a little bit about as well. But again, important to go in and make sure that we're following best practices, continuous monitoring and policy enforcement. So as all of us probably know in, in industry, organizations are rapidly moving to the cloud. And so clearly Amazon Web Services uh, is the market leader and continues to dominate the cloud space. And so really, um, as we see more and more organizations head to the cloud, so almost 60% of enterprises in North America are leveraging public cloud platforms like AWS. And that's also evidenced by um, Amazon's just tremendous growth and you know the growth in the overall cloud market as shown by the different market research reports. But clearly this growth has challenges, right? And so um, again, it's very important to make sure that as we are adopting these new technologies, we understand where the risks are, we're able to go and protect our data. And so again, as some of the market research shows, uh, security misconfigurations and not understanding the new security model can cause challenges. And so really, if uh, you're a program manager or an organization that's obviously uh, leveraging containers, DevOps, cloud, uh, that's great, but you want to make sure 
that you're able to go in and continue to meet the security and compliance requirements that will be required of you as you operate in these environments. And so these are some common challenges. Uh, a lot of times people sort of use the old ways of trying to manage these environments, which doesn't work uh, because they're not able to go in and uh, respond at scale. Uh, the regulatory and compliance requirements continue to change and increase. And, you know, quite honestly, talent is in short supply. So finding qualified cybersecurity, cloud ops, DevOps, uh, and compliance engineers is difficult. And so that all creates sort of a environment where it's challenging for organizations to meet some of these new risks. So we get asked this question really often on from organizations that are obviously interested in doing the right thing. They want to go ahead and start and implementing some of these best practices. But the question is, where do you begin? And so again, we're based in Washington, DC, and we've done many, many years of security and compliance work for government agencies. We truly believe that the NIST uh, cybersecurity standards provide a great resource of free information. And it's a great starting point uh, and a standards-based approach to implementing a information security program. Uh, what's also interesting is we've had conversations with different experts on this topic. And again, NIST is a standard uh, from the US National Institute of Standards and Technology that is what we call legally defensible, right? So it's a standard that has the backing of the US government uh, in terms of how it came about. And so it you start off with a strong baseline and it, there's a lot of information that's available to you for free. And so you can go ahead and adopt it. So for the purposes of today's conversation, we are going to focus on the NIST 800-53 uh, controls. That are used for creating this security program. And so what's interesting is um, a lot of fun people find that the security controls and you know what should we cover and what are the things we should do can be daunting and so we believe that NIST um, pub special publication 800-53 uh, provides a great resource uh, which is fairly complete now some folks may say well it's complicated and it's hard to understand and we really don't know uh, what uh, the control is trying to tell us, but I think if you persevere a little bit or you know find experts that do, um, I think you'll find it's a great starting point. And so that's what we really cover today is how you can go ahead and start your security journey by using the NIST provided security controls and how we at Stack Armor make it really easy or at least easier to sort of implement a robust security and compliance program uh, that is an increasing requirement for many industries and for many organizations. So a little bit about NIST 800-53 and just to sort of uh, warm you up with the lingo, um, you will sort of see references to what's called control families. So there are approximately 17 control families which are groupings of security requirements into basically these categories. Um, the interesting thing is, again, as you're looking for a standard or a basis to go in and implement a robust uh, security program, again, these are the things you want to make sure you cover so that you go in and make sure that you're implementing something and you know something is not left out and also you're not having to reinvent the wheel. So typically there are 17 control families um, the standard allows you to go in and sort of customize it or tailor it to what's called security baselines, high, moderate, or low. Uh, again, depending on your organization, the sensitivity of your data, the risk that you are exposed to, you can go in and determine uh, what um, security controls are most applicable to you. As you can imagine, fewer controls for low, uh, more controls for high. So again, you can go and sort of cherry pick what you like. For most organizations, the 
moderate baseline is the most appropriate one. I think there was some statistic that over 60 to 70 percent of systems, if not 80 percent, are uh, fall into the moderate category. And so the number of controls generally within the moderate baseline are about 325. And so while you know at first blush you might be like, well, you know that's a lot. But you've got to sort of dive into it a little bit and sort of slice and dice and parse it. And what you'll see is all of these are common sense things that help you go in and implement the right controls, policies, procedures, and then technical implementations. And again, as you're an organization and you're looking to tailor this for yourself, you can cherry pick the ones that are important to you depending on your requirements. And so just as a resource, it's a freely available guide. Uh, Rev 5 is coming up real soon, so the link is available to you and I encourage you to go in and take a look at it and, and sort of take advantage of the great work that the folks at NIST have done. So why should you care, right? So why is NIST important to you? And what we find, again, having done this for many years, that more and more industries are com coming under the compliance and security fabric, if you will, uh, that is covered by NIST-based standards. So, for example, if you're a educational or research institution getting federal money, then you are required to go in and demonstrate compliance with uh, FISMA controls, which is the government standard for government systems. But because there have been so many downstream uh, data loss and data breach incidents, um, the government is going in and asking organizations that do business with them to go in and implement stronger security standards, which are embodied in NIST SP 800-53. Also, if you're a DOD contractor through DFAR 7012, uh, they have a sort of um, emerging security standard called NIST SP 800-171. I call it the little brother of uh, uh, 800-53, and so it again has similar controls that you need to go in and implement. Also, if you're a commercial organization that's looking to provide uh, services to the $80 billion IT market in the government, federal, then you must go through what's called the FedRAMP accreditation process, and so you must again go in and leverage the 800-53 controls to go and get there. Um, of course, if you're a government agency, but we are increasingly seeing requirements both at the state side as well as the federal side. And then again, if you're in the healthcare space, particularly the health benefits exchanges, insurance exchanges, they need to comply with a derivative standard that's called MARS E 2.0. And so that also leverages NIST SP 800-53 as a basis. So again, these are industries that need to go in and make sure that they're following uh, the NIST cybersecurity standards. So again, it's an emerging market, it's a growing market, and again, this is where you know compliance is not a choice. And so again, it's good if you go in and use that as a baseline to begin your information security and compliance journey. So moving along, um, what I've done here is, in partnership with my colleague, uh, Terry Grogan, is created what we call a uh, compliance uh, matrix that shows you the different security controls. So we talked a little bit about 325 uh, security controls. And so as you sort of go down the cloud journey, specifically on AWS, then this is a little bit of the workup that you will be required to perform where you need to go in and assess and determine which of those controls apply to you and how you're going to implement them. And so again, for we've done this for many years, and sometimes this is not the easiest exercise to go through. But what we have essentially done is we've gone through these controls uh, for specifically the Amazon cloud service. And so we have gone in and defined out of those 325, really what are the controls that the customer needs to worry about? And as you can see, it's uh, basically a color-coded chart where as you can imagine, as you're using a cloud service like Amazon, there are certain controls that you get out of the box. And again, that's where the experts at Stack Armor have built this interesting new service called Cloud GSS, Threat Alert, 
which basically helps deliver almost uh, 120 to 150 controls, uh, either completely or in some kind of a shared fashion to accelerate your ability to go in and achieve what we call an authority to operate in again, sort of the government lingo a little bit. So again, if you're a defense contractor, if you're an educational institution, uh, or if you're a SaaS provider looking to go and get um, FedRAMP accreditation, you need to go through this exercise to go in and understand who and how you're going to implement these controls. And again, we have done a lot of this hard work for you. And so really what I will do next is show a little bit more about the Stack Armor Threat Alert Cloud GSS. Again, the term GSS is a term that's very commonly used in the FedRAM FISMA government compliance circles. So we've stayed true for that uh, basic terminology. But again, the goal is to go in and deliver a lot of these security services on AWS out of the box. So this is a architectural diagram of um, our Stack Armor Threat Alert uh, GSS. And for those of you that are familiar with cloud and understand uh, how it is architected, specifically the Amazon Cloud Service, uh, the Threat Alert security capabilities are encapsulated in what we call the Stack Armor Threat Alert VPC. And that VPC has critical security services defined, pre-deployed, pre-integrated, that specifically map to the NIST 800-53 controls. And so clearly there's a shared responsibility. And so you can go ahead and add your applications on the top, which are part of your production dev or your application VPCs. And all of those VPCs are monitored and governed by this one central resource. And so therefore you get the benefits of acceleration. Um, you go in and get less duplication and we are able to go in and accelerate your journey towards basically a secure uh, and compliant environment. And so one of the interesting things um, that we do, which is different and we get asked this question a lot is, hey, are you guys a managed services environment? And so um, do we need to buy your service or you know, how exactly is the deployment model? And so really what's unique about our service is what we call an inbound redeployment. And so what that means is we deliver and deploy the Stack Armor Threat Alert VPC with all of the services in your account. And so the, the system boundary, as if you will, is never violated. And so everything is done in your account, in your um, environment. The data never leaves your environment and you don't have to pay expensive subscription fees. Um, and you can pretty much sort of um, govern um, how you choose to go in and evolve that environment and set in place your compliance construct. And so this model is very effective, especially for SaaS companies that are already on AWS and now want to expand into the government market, but just don't want to redo everything. And so that's why we built this solution and it's pretty effective in that regard. The other nice thing is we provide a fairly flexible services catalog, security services catalog, and that again maps to 800-53, but the specific tools are customizable. So we have relationships with uh, certain partners like Splunk, uh, Trend Micro, and Palo Alto, for example. But if you so choose, um, we can go ahead and deploy any other tool of your choice. So you're not forced to go in and use the tools uh, that we prescribe, but we're able to go in and integrate with whatever you have. In terms of the security capabilities that are required, um, on the left you see sort of the security service that Threat Alert delivers. And again, that is a requirement. So again, as you're looking to implement a standard-based security and compliance framework, again, these are the kinds of things you want to go in and make sure that exist. And so again, in, instead of you having to reinvent the wheel, we've done all of this work, hard work. And so you can go in and take benefit of that um, and you know just sort of um, get through a rapid deployment phase um, and, and in compliance state. So uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about Stack Armor Threat Alert today. And so it is, again, like I said, a security service that helps you meet specific security and compliance requirements. 
And it has a couple of features or capabilities um, that are delivered through certain services that come out of the box. So what we have are four key components. Uh, number one is what we call the Stack Armor Threat Alert GSS portal, where basically it's your central point of access for all the different security services that are part of your uh, security VPC. Within that, we have a threat alert portal for security operations. Uh, we have a, a ops alert portal for cloud operations and systems management. And finally, we have a tool called Rapid SSP, which is for creating, again, compliance documentation that's required by some of these agencies and organizations. So my colleague Fawad here will go in and walk you through um, and do a live demo of some of these components and how they all sort of work together. Uh, moving along, in terms of what you will see uh, in the demo, we will show you dashboards. We will show you how we go in and send out alerts and emails. Uh, we have integrations with to tools like ServiceNow and Jira. We also provide alerts through you know, commonly used services like Slack. Um, again, we provide whole uh, full coverage from what we call security and compliance services from code to container to and so, again, we'll walk you through some of these. And you know, if you have an interest in, in, in implementing some of these solutions, please feel free to reach out to us. And we will go in and schedule a detailed demo uh, and discussion for you. So again, in terms of our customers, this is just a partial list. We break down our customers into uh, public sector or government, uh, as I mentioned, educational and nonprofit organizations, and of course, um, healthcare and commercial entities interested in the uh, the FedRAM security and FISMA uh, NIST security based environments. So here are some interesting uh, testimonials from customers that have been using ThreatAlert. Uh, ThreatAlert has been in production for almost over a year now. And so we have uh, almost 30 plus customers using the platform as we speak. And so again, the, uh, the success is in being able to help customers continuously monitor their environment get through the accreditation process if that's of interest and also you know go ahead and implement a proper cloud governance framework which are again requirements to operate securely in the cloud and so this is uh, something a little bit about stack armor like i mentioned we are based here in the washington dc metro area uh, tyson's corner specifically uh, we are an advanced aws partner with the security and compliance competency uh, we uh, were ranked uh, 136 in the Inc. 500 list of fastest growing private companies in the U.S. Uh, pretty happy about that accomplishment. But again, we are looking to help organizations that want to implement a good uh, and standards-based security and compliance program and make sure that they are able to protect their information. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleague Fuwad, who will walk you through a quick demo uh, of services that the portal provides. Uh, Fawad, uh, why don't you go ahead and take it away from here and you know feel free to introduce yourself. Great, uh, thank you GP. Hello everyone, um, my name is Fawad Siraj and I am a principal and senior architect at Stack Armor and today um, as GP mentioned I'll be demonstrating uh, Stack Armor Threat Alert GSS and this is a great solution because what we've done is we've wrapped our security stack that helps you meet NIST controls um, into somebody's environments. So in other words, in boundary. And so what that enables people to do is still have all their data reside in their account um, and have their boundary around this stack while also getting managed services from us and, and help in terms of uh, maintaining the controls, maintaining the logging, um, and the security posture. So I'm gonna quickly walk you through. Um, as you can see, this solution's already been deployed into um, an example environment. Um, and we have a portal here where you can basically log in um, using a single sign-on. So SAML 2.0 um, is supported on this. Uh, so that way we don't have to maintain users. We can have other people just incorporate their identity uh, broker into this, something like Okta or Duo or whatnot. So once once you get in here, um, as GP mentioned, we have the tools that you can go to. So the first one 
uh, Threat Alert Continuous Security Monitoring. If you click on that, you'll see the dashboard here. And here's an example of your cloud configuration. Uh, the vulnerabilities. So this example dashboard uh, basically show you uh, the overview of um, uh, all the uh, incidents um, that are reported. And so you can see there's a dashboard here that basically you can sort by severity and things like that. Hey, um, Kawhi, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we lost the screen share. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that, people. So um, let me just go back real quick. Uh, I was just showing. So can you see that now, Terry? Yes, thanks. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. Um, so I was, I was, as I was mentioning, um, this is our Stack uh, Armor Threat Alert GSS portal. Uh, this is deployed within your environment. Um, and so you can basically come into the portal. You can have uh, different tools. So, for example, we have Threat Alert Continuous Security Monitoring. So, if I just click that, that brings up uh, our Threat Alert dashboard, which shows you um, vulnerabilities um, and also uh, uh, something we call a plan of action and milestones. So, in, in other words, if there's a finding that's of high risk, um, this will show you that, hey, you have to basically justify it or you have to take a look and record it. And so one neat thing that we've done is we've tied it into your ITSM. So currently we have JIRA set up, but we can also do service now. And what that enables um, a lot of the community to do is basically track these issues and make sure that they get addressed um, by someone and resolved. So that way there isn't a severe um, uh, issue in the environment. So um, that's basically Threat Alert. Um, you can also run reports and search. Um, so if we go back, uh, we can also take a, a look at Ops Alert, which is our cloud spending and operations. Um, this is a great tool because every day, uh, what we like to call our morning coffee time, we can basically come in and we can take a look at what's running in the environment, how much money we're spending. Um, and, and this is great because this will allow you to know what's happening, uh, where, where are the costs going. So, for example, if there are instances that are below 10%, that'll give you an idea of, you know, the, a lot of the instances aren't being used. That can be a cost savings. Um, so, so that was basically deployed in the environment. So I just want to show you, show you with some real data. Um, so the, this will lost the screen share again. Sorry. Sorry about that. All right. Can you guys see that? Yep. Okay. Sorry about that. I switched over to show some data because the other one was, um, in a, in a new environment. So just to give you guys an idea of how much you're spending, what your utilization is in the environment, Ops Alert does a great job of providing that insight. That way you can take some action uh, in terms of either turning off stuff or just investigating further. And then we also present the data for each of the tiles down here. So as you can see, you'll see like two cents, one cents, um, things like that. Um, so that's for operational financial operations and uh, systems. Um, sorry, let me just go back real quick. Can you guys? So just going back. Um, sorry, just give me one second. Okay, so going back uh, to the portal, um, uh, we have also Machine Data Insight. Uh, here we're using this to basically get insight into any sort of reporting, um, uh, you know, dashboards for particular items, and this is where we kind of, uh, we integrate all the stuff, all the application logs, events, everything from your system um, into uh, Spawn Cure and, and basically do search queries. So this is uh, a part of our stack as well. Uh, then we also have Trend Micro, which uh, is a great 
um, uh, technology and it looks like it just timed out. So let me just look here. And the So, uh, sorry, I apologize. Um, so basically this uh, trend micro shows um, uh, shows all the endpoint protections. Um, this basically shows all like any vulnerabilities, everything. So this is integrated into your environment and there are, and there are agents that are deployed onto each machine um, for that as well. Um, so, so that's for more malware um, uh, and also uh, application control. And Trend Micro is a great product because they, they support cloud natively as well. Uh, so we're essentially uh, uh, putting that in the environment um, as well. So moving along uh, for the next, uh, we also have Sonar Cube, which is more for code analysis. So we've deployed that as well. So that way, if you're trying to deploy any code, this can actually give you an idea if there's any vulnerabilities that are coming up. Um, so this is just to give you a, a, a view real quick. And then of course, Rapid SSP uh, that GP mentioned earlier is our um, other product that will help uh, users quickly um, go through all their NIST and DFARS uh, controls and kind of give them a score and a a SSP that they can provide to their CISO or to their uh, compliance uh, team to show them what controls are being met and where there might be gaps um, and whatnot. Um, so uh, that's pretty much all I had to show. And you know, this is uh, this is something that we're very proud of, and we keep continuing to build on. Um, the greatest advantage is that customers like the fact that it's being deployed in their environment, and um, we're helping manage all of this for them as well, as well as collect all their information to do the reporting and the, the logging for everything. So um, having said that, I'm gonna turn it over to GP. Thank you. Thank you Fawad for that demo and folks um, for uh, you watching and I realized there were some blips in there, but please feel free to shoot us an email if you're interested in getting a deeper dive. So we have uh, for organizations that are market for essentially going through a uh, FISMA or FedRAMP uh, uh, accreditation. Uh, we are interested in helping you, obviously, and we can do that by essentially doing a free assessment uh, for you. So um, I will just share with you a, a slide which information. Um, and help you uh, go in and sort of um, schedule that um, uh, call with us. So um, I'm having some issues with my RDP uh, session. So give me just one second to get that squared away. But in the meantime, uh, I will ask my, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, webinar administrator to see if he has any questions for us. Um, let's go ahead and see here. Let's look at the offline channel here. Um, so here is one question uh, around what are the uh, uh, FedRAMP controls or how do you go in and help somebody get through the FedRAMP accreditation using the Stack Armor Threat Alert uh, GSS? Uh, Terry, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of uh, uh, pawn this question off to you. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how Threat Alert addresses the FedRAMP compliance uh, process? Sure. Uh, in fact, if you guys remember back to the, the beautiful color chart, um, there are a number of those controls that are uh, essentially, um, I want to say automatically, inherently uh, in place once this is deployed. Uh, and as GP also mentioned, there are some shared controls or a number of those controls um, there are technical implementations, for example, like the auditing uh, controls <clears throat> that are implemented uh, for the infrastructure. 
uh, which gives you kind of a, a leg up. Um, there's always going to be a little bit of a, a shared responsibility. Thank you. Um, for things that are at the application layer, for example. Uh, so while we can implement um, auditing configurations for the underlying infrastructure of the instances, <clears throat> if you're deploying an application or you're adding another um, you know, system of VPC w within that with other, uh, other components, uh, then that's where the shared responsibility comes in. Uh, but you have a, a very good uh, infrastructure environment that's that's set up and documented essentially with those implementation descriptions that would apply to the infrastructure level. So that greatly lessens the amount of uh, documentation and work. Uh, I think anyone who's gone or attempted to go through this process uh, would agree that the the implementation piece of it is the easy part. Uh, the documentation piece is the one that, that seems to take the longest and has the most effort uh, behind it. Uh, it's a lot easier to, to get things configured. Uh, it takes a lot longer to get them documented. So the fact that a, a lot of this will, will come with some documentation uh, for all the infrastructure items that, that are deployed, uh, that definitely helps. <clears throat> and then, of course, there's a, there's a fair amount of translation that is required uh, because none of the NIST documentation, FedRAMP documentation requirements are written in what I would call human readable language. <laughs> um, so we have the expertise as well, uh, just based on the many years that, that we've been dealing with compliance requirements. Uh, understanding where those controls originated from uh, all the way back, uh, I'll date myself here, to you know, the Orange Book days uh, in the 80s and early 90s. So we've seen those controls essentially move forward from, from way back then and, until now. You know, in fact, there are still controls uh, identified in SP 800-53 uh, that I can look at and say, yeah, you know, that that originated with, you know, the red book or the orange book or whatever. Uh, and it's just kind of morphed through the years with differences in technology. So, um, That's sorry, I kind of rambled there a little bit, but essentially we're also there to, uh, to help guide you with, you know, what the requirement really means. No, that's very well said, Terry. Thank you for that um, input on uh, an insight into the process. So can you, I mean, based on your experience in obviously having gone through the FISMA or the FedRAMP a and &E process, I mean, in your assessment, based on, you know, some of the projects you've supported for customers in this journey, what would you say has been, in your experience, the acceleration in being able to use some of, as you said, some of the predefined security control implementation language with, you know, almost 100, uh, 100 odd controls that we are delivering out of the box or with some kind of uh, shared responsibility. Uh, what sort of you've been your practical experience in terms of the acceleration that customers have experienced in getting through the process, if you will? Uh, well, honestly, it, it comes down to the fact that, you know, most of the customers we've engaged with, uh, they know their technology, they know their business, they know next to nothing about, you know, security requirements and, and the process for accreditation. So the acceleration for them has been primarily we can ask, you know, a, a handful of questions. Um, let's make it a little bit simplistic um, and essentially take over that documentation piece for them and you know give them that guidance to say hey you know you're going to need to do this 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 and this uh, because a lot of our you know commercial customers come in and like I said they have a great product they have a great service they know it in and out they know absolutely nothing about the accreditation process so that's where you know they can engage us you know kind of like I, I don't know a lot about the tax code that's why I have a CPA do my taxes I give them some basic information about what I'm doing, um, what I need, and they take it from there, and I don't have to worry about it. 
Uh, and that's, I think, one of the biggest benefits that Stack Armor provides to its clients is they can kind of hand that over to us and we know exactly what to do, uh, when to do it, and we can communicate that with them at the engineering level as well as the CEO level. I think that's, uh, I liked your analogy with the, you know, accountant and tax code and uh, NIST and FedRAMP and sort of how it gets applied. So let's see um, Srikant from a web administration standpoint, webinar administration standpoint. Do we have any other questions? Okay. Uh, we have one here. Um, and this question is, let me read this, is um, the, the threat alert solution, how is it different from other managed services or FedRAMP accredited services? Are you guys FedRAMP accredited? Okay, um, that's a great question. Um, I think um, that's very important. I think some of the things that we talked about earlier are very relevant when we said that um, it is what we call an inboundry service. So in other words, it's really running within a customer's environment, not uh, in our environment, so that your data never leaves. And so what that essentially means is we don't have to be FedRAMP accredited, and we are basically providing you with the engineering and the acceleration, if you will, to be able to engineer your own FedRAMP accredited environment. So um, hopefully that answers that. Um, the second part of that question was, um, uh, it has gone in, and the second question is, um, if we are able to go in and customize uh, these solutions. Uh, yes, so answer to that is yes, we do provide tailoring of the services as Fuad showed you. Uh, we have different tools that are already out of the box. Uh, and those tools just, just uh, so that folks understand are very carefully chosen uh, because they uh, allow us to go in and generate reports uh, and the artifacts that we know the assessors look for. And so you can certainly, you know, mix and match, remove it, add something else. Um, and uh, you're also able to go in and obviously, um, you know, tailor them. So if somebody uses some other product, you can certainly go in and use that and we'll happily integrate on it and integrate with it. Um, uh, another question here, can rapid SSP be used to publish uh, and entire system uh, security plan, graphics controls, et cetera, and what other artifacts? Great question. Uh, the uh, rapid SSP solution, just so that we are uh, reflected, art, uh, articulate its value proposition accurately, is really designed to do three things. Number one, it's designed to get away from an Excel spreadsheet or a Word document based SSP because of two primary reasons. Number one, we want to make sure that the SSP documentation itself can be upgraded and modified and you don't have to go through this huge sort of cut and paste exercise. Uh, the second thing is, uh, yes, it allows you to go ahead and put in diagrams, attach files, uh, put in any kind of an artifact. You can put in your solution architecture diagram, link it, etc. And we're happy to go in and do a custom demo uh, for, uh, for you if that's of interest. Uh, and the second thing it does is it also performs the security assessment part of the function. So a lot of times what happens is in terms of technical terminology, we provide obviously the uh, controls, which is the uh, 800-53 uh, REV4 uh, controls, but we also provide the A guidance integrated within our, uh, the SSP solution. And the reason for that is a lot of times there's a lot of back and forth between the assessor and the persons writing the controls. And so if the control, uh, the people that are writing the security controls already know what the assessor is going to look for. For example, they might go in and test a control. They might interview somebody or examine. So as long as you know that, then you can do a better job in articulating those controls and we provide some helpful guidance in that regard. And so uh, the SSP, the rapid SSP solution is not a generic sort of, um, you know, compliance document generator. Um, um, so for example, it will not go in and generate a contingency plan for you. We expect you to go in and have that, but you can 
refer it back in SS in the rapid SSP solution. Again, it's designed to be a lightweight um, solution to go in and get you started in essentially putting together the SSP documentation, the SAR documentation, and also your poem on items. Um, another question here, um, how does this actually work? Agents are on the host and or ingestion of data. Um, that's a great question. So again, from a security and compliance standpoint, we try and make sure that the solution is as agentless as possible. For those of you that have implemented such systems before, you realize that the more uh, you have sort of an external footprint uh, with things like agents, et cetera, it makes it harder to patch, upkeep, and you know get through sort of the accreditation process. So we use um, uh, what we call agent-less first policy. So most of the uh, security plumbing, if you will, uh, is agent-less, but in certain situations, it's unavoidable. So for example, if you're looking for IDS, IPS capability, you know, from something like Trend Micro, then you have to use something called, you know, a host-based uh, security service to go in and protect that instance. So sometimes it's unavoidable, uh, but, you know, even for other things like Splunk, as an example, you can use forwarders or you can use different techniques to go in and do log shipping and things like that. So again, the goal is to make it as easy as possible. The other thing too is we heavily leverage uh, Amazon cloud native services. So again, our goal is to produce uh, the, the compliance with the NIST 800-53 controls with as lean and mean, if you will, of a stack as we can. So in other words, we liberally use services like CloudWatch Logs, we'll use Systems Manager and you know all of those interesting services, Security Hub, CloudTrail, what have you, to go in and make sure that this scenario, these security controls can be met as uh, effectively as possible with as few third-party deployments as possible. Um, another question on the SSP uh, documentation for DFARS compliance. Um, yes, so Rapid SSP is designed for uh, exactly meeting the uh, DFAR 7012 um, NIST SP 800-171 based compliance. And so uh, Terry Grogan, who's our director of compliance and his team, they help customers. Um, and we will share a case study with you very soon. We are in the, implement we're in the middle of three implementations for some really large uh, government contractors to get them through the process and give them a compliant environment based on AWS and AWS GovCloud. And so as part of that project, our security team goes in and obviously helps with the implementation. Uh, and then Rapid SSP is then used to go in and provide the control descriptions and generate really three documents, uh, the SSP, the SAR, the POEM, and also provide the systems inventory. And all of this is done digitally at the end of the day, at the end of the process, it goes in and gives you a signed, if you will, uh, SSP PDF that you can then go ahead and submit as part of your compliance package from a uh, DFAR standpoint. Again, great question. Uh, again, we've done this for many customers and we're happy to go in and have specific conversations with you um, if that's what your requirements are. But again, our core markets and customers are uh, in the government contracting, uh, DFARS um, and NIST compliance space. Again, that's sort of um, uh, our scope of engagements that we normally do. Um, I'm just looking through some of the questions here. Oh, this is another great question. Does inboundry mean, uh, does it allow the customer to keep their system design proprietary? Um, I think that's a great question and I'm not sure I exactly understand what that means, but uh, the way I'm interpreting that question is when it means in boundary, it means that you do not have to interface with any external third party service to achieve your accredit accreditation status. So what that means is you can go ahead and uh, keep your existing architecture supplemented or enhance it by bringing in the threat alert VPC and basically get those continuous monitoring and compliance controls um, added to your existing environment. That's exactly the objective. Uh, most of the solutions that we've seen in the market today, they force you to use an external third party service or 
they you know will force you as an msp to use their infrastructure and we just believe as a fundamental model uh, the data especially security data should be as close as possible to where you are uh, or where your system is and so again the security system should be co-located with your data or application and so that's really the architecture uh, that we have for this solution again folks these were great questions and I know we had some <laughs> blips with the screen share, and so we will certainly refine our demo. Uh, again, we appreciate your patience and support. Um, please let us know if you're interested in a more detailed demo or discussion on how we can help you meet your compliance requirements, uh, whether they are on the DFAR 7012 side, uh, whether you're looking to go through a FISMA uh, accreditation process, uh, or even get um, in queue with the FEDRA uh, jab uh, at the GSA to get through uh, and be able to sell into the uh, market. And so again, with this, I will go ahead and bring this session to a close. And I will just make one other quick question uh, on, uh, check on this. Uh, there's a comment, third parties do not guarantee information security. Um, I think that's a good comment. I would just, uh, I, I don't disagree with it, but um, only thing is it depends on the security program. So in the context of FedRAMP, uh, there is a third party that does the accreditation, which is obviously different from guarantee. Um, I don't think anybody can guarantee um, uh, the security posture, but really what um, uh, from an, I think this question was in the context of uh, DFARS compliance. Uh, your statement is accurate. Uh, there is nobody that can, at this stage at least, I think that's going to change uh, based on our information um, that the accreditation process is going to come in sometime in the future. But yes, in, for now, there is no third party that can attest to whether or not your documentation is complete. And so therefore, uh, really what we are doing with Rapid SSP is making it easy for somebody to go in and demonstrate compliance. And again, since we've done this for a long time, the goal is to go in and help you get through that process. Um, there are some other questions here, but I think what we will do in the interest of time is wrap this session up and we will go ahead and email you the responses um, as we get them. Again, we appreciate you listening in, uh, tuning in. And again, please don't hesitate to send us an email uh, at uh, solutions at stackarmor.com. Uh, do give us feedback on what we did well, what we uh, need to do better. And we are implementing a new program uh, in partnership with AWS. They have an initiative called ATO on AWS. And so we're working to go in and create a capability where if you qualify, we're able to do some uh, initial gap assessment and feasibility assessments. So again, if you're interested um, and if you're a either government contractor or a commercial organization going through the FedRAMP accreditation process. We'd love to talk to you and uh, make sure that we're able to go in and answer any questions that you have. With that, I will sign off and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.